There weren't many records that Max Verstappen and Red Bull failed to decimate in 2023. From most consecutive wins, to most laps led, to most times I fell into a nearly fatal stupor during a race weekend. You name it, they did it. But despite everyone's Spotify wrapped containing the Austrian national anthem, it was far from a perfect year, and some milestones remained mercifully beyond the scarlet bovine's hoof-like grasp. The most notable of which was failing to become the first constructor to complete a perfect season, winning every single race. A carrot that has tantalisingly dangled before F1 competitors. Since the bizarre inclusion of the Indy 500 to the championship in the 50s denied Alfa Romeo and Ferrari that honour, and a Jean-Louis Schlesser-shaped obstacle rebuffed McLaren in 1988. A 100% win record would not only have been one of F1's most notable landmarks, but would have also matched a record set half a century ago, wherein every single race was won by the same engine supplier. And that record wasn't set by a Ferrari, Honda or Mercedes engine, but a name somewhat unfamiliar to the tongues of the modern F1 generation. Ford, or Ford Cosworth to be strictly accurate. Back in the day, a Ford Cosworth engine was the only path to success for any budding Grand Prix entrant from mighty oaks like Lotus or McLaren to the tiny saplings of privateers that sprung up throughout F1 history. Built by the Cosworth company, the Ford Cosworth DFV was based on a Ford Cortina cylinder block and was backed by ample Ford sponsorship. During its peak glory years from 1967 to 1983, a Ford Cosworth was responsible for 65% of all Grand Prix wins. In 1973, a Ford Cosworth engine won every single race, to the surprise of no one because they were only matching a feat they'd already achieved in 1969. Add into the mix 13 drivers and 10 constructors titles, and there are few else who can boast such a magnificent record, in the engine department at least. Yet such success could not stand at more of a parallel to Ford's time running their own Formula One team. In 2026, when Ford joins forces with Red Bull, those Milton Keynes headquarters will have an air of familiarity about them to the famous Blue Oval, for those same corridors once housed Ford's own aspiration of F1 dominance, under their Jaguar-branded umbrella. An aspiration that would rival the likes of Toyota for most simultaneously overhyped and underwhelming manufacture entry in the history of the sport. A Jaguar that would bound into Formula One with a mighty roar, but exit with the most timid of mews. Today we're donning our finest veterinarian slash engineer costumes and having a little prod and poke at this black cat to see if we can't figure out just how it all went wrong and if there was ever the faintest of possibilities of Jaguar navigating from jeopardy to jubilation. The story of Jaguar begins not with the infamous prowling black cat, but with a tint of tartan, a song of bagpipes in the air and the meaty scent of freshly made haggis. The year is 1987, and Paul Stewart, son of triple world champion Sir Jackie, wanted to go racing. The ever-savvy Stuart Sr. hesitantly agreed, but in order to avoid the outward meddling of other motorsport figures, the two agreed to do it together. And thus, Paul Stewart Racing was born. Paul and his eponymous team worked through the lower series from Formula Fords to British Formula 3, all the way up to Formula 3000, where Paul called time on his racing career at the end of 1993. Whilst Paul's success was relatively moderate, his team enjoyed a lot more. Between 1992 and 1998, Paul Stewart Racing hoovered up all but one British Formula 3 title, including a dominant run from Jan Magnussen in 1994, who won 14 of the 18 rounds. The same levels of supremacy weren't quite matched in Formula 3000, but that didn't stop the likes of David Coulthard or Gilles de Ferran tasting success in the category just below Formula 1. A move into F1 was a logical next step, and in January 1996, Stewart secured a tasty five-year development deal with Ford, alongside bundles of sponsorship from Malaysia, and a promising pair of drivers in Magnussen and Rubens Barrichello. The late 90s had been an era where new teams like Pacific or Forty had been and gone from F1 without much more than a whimper, whilst others like Andrea Moda or Mastercard Lola were delivering a masterclass in just how not to start a new team. But Stewart remained one of a handful to knock it out of the park. Granted, not in the reliability stakes, 
Over three quarters of all races ended with one or both Stuarts parked up at the side of the road during 1997. But it was clear the outfit had promise and horsepower aplenty, and it all went right in the moistness of Monaco, where Barrichello took a sensational second place to the delight of all. Second album syndrome struck for 1998, and the mechanical failures as Smashmouth might croon kept on coming and wouldn't stop coming. Barrichello could only scrape together four points all year, whilst Magnussen only managed the one before being unceremoniously booted out in favour of Jos Verstappen, who failed to drag the car any higher. But for 1999, with Barrichello now joined by the experienced Johnny Herbert, Stewart's flickering potential finally set alight. Though both cars suffered smoky beginnings to the year in Australia, Rubens flew from the pit lane and arguably could have won if not for a stop-go penalty. He then led early on in Brazil and claimed a well-earned podium in Imola after that. Not long after was another third in France, having successfully navigated the treacherous waters of qualifying to claim pole. What really put the icing on the cake was the European Grand Prix, where, in soggy conditions once more, Herbert came through the chaos all around to take a very popular win, with Rubens not far behind in third. By season's end, the team had ranked fourth, ahead of recent champions Williams and Benetton. According to Stewart, the team was moving in the right direction and was starting to compete on the fringes of the leading pack. The one thing they needed to take the team from solid midfield operation to championship protagonists was a large injection of money to upgrade and update equipment, recruitment and facilities. And as luck would have it, a large bundle of cash was exactly what their engine partners, the Ford Motor Company, was in possession of. And what better use for that dosh than to purchase a ready-made competitive F1 entry? The notion of a fully-fledged Ford factory effort had been floating around as far back as the early days of Stewart's first tentative steps towards F1. In 1995, as Sir Jackie wrangled the deals together for his new outfit, he and Ford's vice president Jacques Nasser discussed the structure of the team. Sir Jackie mooted that Ford could outright own the business but leave the day-to-day running of the team to the Stewart clan for the price of cost plus 10%. All the benefits of having your brand in F1 with none of the fuss. But NASA said the board wouldn't agree, and that was that. But the kindling had been set in the Ford fires. Many will point to an infamous moment at the 1998 Hungarian Grand Prix as the final spark that would lead to Ford's roaring desire to plunge into team ownership. From the pit wall, NASA would gaze upon the veritable sea of red from the visiting Tifosi and turn to Stewart. Why aren't they all white flags with a blue oval, he'd ask. Why can't we get that? NASA would later then proclaim, next year we will make this a sea of green. Less than a month later, Sir Jackie found himself meeting with the Ford board, who queried whether they could buy a controlling interest in the team. Stewart's response was that if they wanted control, they'd have to purchase the whole outfit. In Sir Jackie's own words, somebody connected to Ford subsequently mentioned a price that was way below our valuation, and nothing more was said. Stewart wouldn't hear another peep from Ford regarding a team purchase for another seven months. Then in March of 1999, whilst working on a vehicle development project at Ford headquarters in Dearborn, he found the shape of NASA sidling up to him. We want to buy Stewart Grand Prix were the key takeaways from the conversation. After a similar approach to buyout had former partner in Benetton had broken down, Wolfgang Reitzel, the new head of Ford's premier automotive group, was tasked with pulling this deal together. Thus began a period of negotiations. Ford would name a price. Stewart would reject it. Ford would name a higher price. Stewart would reject it again. But momentum was gathering. The matter was even given its own codename Project Hilton by the Stewarts, to avoid any distractions from within the team. On the 8th of June 1999, the deal was struck. Upon their arrival at the next race, Stuart gathered his team aside and told them, this is the best possible news. Your jobs are safe and Ford has the will and the resources to take this team to the next level. There's no downside. Perhaps now would be as good a time as any for us to question Ford's motivations to purchase their own team and highlight the one or two red flags there. Ford were in a Disney-esque phase of gobbling up companies that offered new capacity, from Aston Martin and Jaguar to Cosworth. An F1 outfit was the next logical step. 
And why suffer through years of hard graft and reliability turmoils like Stuart had endured, when one could purchase a ready-made entry into F1, not only an established operation, but one operating at the upper ends of the grid? Ford would, logically, rock up and immediately take it to the Ferraris and McLarens, with their brand front and centre for that success. Leaving aside the touch of arrogance and close-mindedness such an approach spoke of, there were other more worrisome motivations at play. For a while now, there had been a growing sense of anything you can do, I can do better from Ford HQ. Supposedly, there are a few people within Ford who are less than impressed with the reliability record of previous years. A fair few who are growing impatient at the team's rate of progress, and others who are of the mindset that the Stewart brand was being over-promoted, leaving Ford in the shade. Despite the fact that, as Sir Jackie puts it, Stewart and Ford had been complementary in the sport for nearly 35 years. Indeed, nowhere was Ford's sense of entitlement more on show than perhaps at the first race after the Stewart purchase, where according to Sir Jackie, a number of Ford executives showed up to the circuit and were ready to take over the team then and there. Supposedly, they would even hang around the pits doing their best impressions of your dad, shaking heads, tutting and whispers of, oh, I wouldn't do it like that. Such sentiments neatly sidestepped the fact they were emanating from executives with as much knowledge and experience in F1 circles as myself with the third division of Bulgarian football. More questionable practices came from the seemingly strange choice to brand the new works outfit not as Ford, Ford F1 team or even Henry Ford's Flying Grand Prix Circus, but to instead thrust their Jaguar brand into the spotlight. Yes, Jaguar had its own racing pedigree. Think Jaguar and many will conjure up images of runs of victories at Le Mans or the iconically successful XJR sports car programme. But barring one start from privateer Clement Biondetti in a self-built Ferrari Jaguar hybrid car back in 1950, the Jaguar brand had failed to place even one paw into the Grand Prix paddock. Whereas Ford was intrinsically linked to the DNA of F1 through their involvement with the Ford Cosworth engine, NASA justified this decision from a brand identity perspective, wanting Ford America to be aligned with NASCAR and Ford Europe with the WRC, leaving space for Ford's luxury brands elsewhere, Jaguar in Formula One and perhaps Aston Martin within GT racing. But on a subconscious level, it spoke of a lack of confidence in fully promoting the Ford brand, a worry in how it might look if Stewart's 1999 form was just a flash in the pan and 2000 would recall the smoky struggles of previous years, a thought that maybe it would be less risky to utilise the Jaguar name, one that, should it be splashed in mud, would leave the Ford legacy intact. Yet for all those red flags, plus the added benefit of knowing just how history would record Jaguar racing, scanning through previews and predictions for their maiden season provides hype levels that almost beggar belief. New teams with dizzyingly high expectations were nothing new in Formula 1. Bear in mind that we had just come off the back of BAR's debut year, one in which the team famously boasted that they would win their first ever race, and instead limped away from that year as the only team who failed to score a point. So it wasn't a surprise to hear at the team's official launch at Lord's Cricket Ground in January, amidst their hedonistic tagline of the cat is back scrawled here, there and everywhere the likes of Reitzel proudly proclaiming that he fully believed Jaguar would be race winners in the year to come, with titles swiftly following in 2001. Yet perhaps what stands Jaguar out from so many other teams with lofty ambitions, your BARs, Toyotas or Aston Martins, was the fact that such positivity was being echoed by just about every journalist and media outlet around. Murray Walker, admittedly never a fully reliable source for predictions, had proudly stated that Jaguar should be up at the front and that they might just make it into the McLaren-Ferrari bracket, the duo who had fought for the world title the previous year. Bruce Jones, writing in the official Grand Prix guide of the year ahead, felt that after Stewart had moved to new heights last year, there was no reason they shouldn't maintain this form. Even rival Ferrari boss Luca de Montezemolo was happy to see Jaguar sharing the grid with them. Their green puts me in mind of the lotus of Jim Clark, he reminisced happily. Perhaps the reason for such commonplace positivity was that it was the most logical conclusion to make. Stuart had just finished off with their best ever season. All they needed was more backing to take them to the next level, and they had that. 
Add into the mix the skills of designer Gary Anderson, the watchful eye of the consulting stewards assisting new boss forward executive Neil Ressler, and the talents of their newest race winner Johnny Herbert, now paired with newly recruited 1999 title runner-up Eddie Irvine. The two promptly finished first and second during a pre-season test at Jerez, and came away from there with the belief that race wins were just over the horizon. Maybe this air of positivity is one of the reasons that so many regard Jaguar as such an inherent failure. For the outfit managed to take all these fantastic ingredients and concoct the soggiest bottom of a year. Hollywood handshake worthy, it was not. Irvine qualified 7th on his Jaguar debut within a second of pole. And that was about as positive as the Black Cat's first steps would be. Herbert was a whole two seconds further back and within six laps, both Jaguars had retired. Paddock talk had already switched from hype to hyperbole and the consensus seemed to be that the Jaguar F1 effort was closer in speed to one of their luxury road cars than any Jaguar sports car. Their first points went begging next time out in Brazil when Irvine spun off from a comfortable sixth and it took until Monaco race seven of the year for Jaguar to finally break their points duck when Irvine came home in fourth in what reports of the time dubbed a very unspectacular drive, and one more due to attrition than any semblance of speed. That fourth place was one of just two point scoring finishes that year, the other being a solitary point at Malaysia the final round. A final four point tally marked a 900% drop off in points from the previous year, and Jaguar slumped to finish a lowly ninth, ahead of only the ever underfunded Minardis and the woeful Prosts. The proclamation of being race winners in their first year already felt like a lifetime ago. It would probably be quicker to list what wasn't wrong with the Jaguar that year. The aerodynamics were a notable weak point causing the car to suffer on used tyres, only heightened by the baffling choice to keep their team base at Milton Keynes, but having their wind tunnel in California, which for the less geographically inclined, is a little further than just down the road from Milton Keynes. Anderson has admitted that when it came to the design of the R1, it was a concept being pushed to the limit. But in his words, every team does that because if you don't, you are left behind. The problem came from understanding where those risks had failed to come off and how to fix them. Shortly after the third round in San Marino, where the Jaguars had circulated home in 7th and 10th, Anderson was itching to get all hands on deck to identify just what was going wrong with the car. Bafflingly, the race-winning designer was promptly smacked on the wrists and told no, that was not the forward way. He needed to be hands-off and allow only those involved in the inflicted car areas to rectify them. It was the same story in the engine department, where only Cosworth were privy to engine performance data, which again made troubleshooting a lot more complicated. Perhaps this notion wasn't just the Ford way though. According to Anderson, the engines were Ford's babies and we were never allowed to be in a position to criticise Cosworth even though we knew that the engine wasn't producing the power figures we'd seen in 1999. Weirdly, I can understand the idea behind this structure. As someone who manages in the hospitality trade, it makes sense to have team members focused on a specific job role each day, thus making the whole operation run smoothly. The issue here is that it A, ignored the wealth of experience Gary Anderson possessed, and B, it utterly failed at generating solutions. That's not to say solutions weren't found by Anderson and co. After finally seeing one of the wind tunnel tests in person at the end of September, no less, and concluding that it was utterly useless, Anderson's crew took the car to an airfield in Yorkshire and conducted their own tests with a high-speed camera and some very high-tech cotton wool taped all over the diffuser. A critical error in the diffuser design was identified and rectified. Such was the improvement on the car next time out in Japan. Both cars qualified in the top 10 for only the second time all year, finished just outside of the points, and such a result was decreed their best performance of the year. Irvine even claimed the car was now better than the Ferrari he'd driven the year before, one with which he'd won multiple races. Just how better things might have been if things had been allowed to be done the Anderson way rather than the forward way. Instead, Anderson was rewarded by being shown a door and asked to use it. Equally disrupted was the team's management structure that year. It might be a surprise to hear the lengths Anderson had to go to find solutions for the R1, 
given the presence of the experienced stewards in the outfit. But sadly, both of them departed their positions by the end of May. First, Sir Jackie stood down as team chairman at the car's launch, and just a few months later, Paul Stewart was forced to relinquish his role as CEO when diagnosed with colon cancer. That left Wrestler running the whole operation without the guiding hands of the Stewarts, and given his own off-track problems, a serious illness for his young daughter, was it any wonder things went off the rails? With players like Anderson, the Stewarts, and Wrestler now moving about, it was safe to declare that a long, drawn-out game of musical chairs had begun in earnest. By the time the music stopped for 2001, there were two empty chairs available. First, a race seat to replace the retiring Herbert. Though the British pairing of Dario Franchitti and Jensen Button were linked to the role, the seat eventually went, somewhat underwhelmingly, to test driver Luciano Berti. For a team targeting the top of the field, it seemed like an odd choice. He'd neither particularly impressed in junior categories nor his one-off drive the previous year, and it smacked more of being a you'll-do option, never great for an enormous corporation with title-winning ambitions who could have and should have been attracting the biggest of names to their outfit. The signing of Pedro de la Rosa as test driver with the promise of a 2002 race seat further implied Luciano was nothing more than a stopgap solution and did little to help settle the Brazilian. Perhaps even odder was the recruitment of their new team principal. Wrestler had vacated his role to care for his daughter, and that departure seemingly installed a new revolving door within the office. First in was Bobby Rahal, a man with a multitude of experience of running teams in America, but equally one with no experience of working within the vastly more complex environment of F1, bar the briefest of appearances as a driver in the late 70s. And whilst his opening quote of, I wasn't a wanker driver, I'm not going to be a wanker boss, provided chuckles in the media, it seemed in direct contrast to the corporate personality of Jaguar's leading brass. It wouldn't be the only source of disagreement between the two parties. Rahal stated that his aim was one of achieving respectability, which seemed like an odd choice of words. For respectability was a rather open-ended barometer for success. For a team like Minardi, respectability could clearly mean not being a million miles off the pace and maybe snatching the odd point. But for a team in a different budgetary atmosphere like Jaguar, what did respectability mean for them? Perhaps hoping for the best and an air of, surely it can't be as bad as last year. Things started slowly. Irvine trundled to 11th place in Australia, which was promptly followed by four retirements on the bounce, the last of which scuppered a potential fourth place and left the faces in the Jaguar garage as long as a Coraline ghost. A lack of development was cited as the main reason for the ongoing struggles, with Irvine declaring, the car is the same car from the beginning of the year. That seemed to spark the garage into life and some changes to the R2 were brought forward for Monaco, including a new diffuser and aerodynamic package, which provided a great hunk of downforce. That in turn seemed to bring a spark to Irvine, who duly qualified sixth and then held off the BAR of Villeneuve to claim Jaguar's first ever podium. By a quirk of fate, Monaco had also been where predecessors Stewart had taken their first podium, and years later, successors Red Bull would also take their maiden podium on those tight and twisty corners. Yet it seemed like that was all well and good enough for the team, and the performance dropped away again, highlighted by the fact that Irvine only scored once more in the remaining 10 races. The final result of the year saw their points tally double, and the team not so much sore but gently hover up one more place in the constructors' table, vaulting the soon-to-fold Arrows team. Once more, it seemed car troubles were to blame. The R2 might as well have been designed by Rishi Sunak, given how conservative it was. After the unending mountain of reliability woes suffered the previous year, it perhaps made good business sense to play it safe and focus on having a car that could at least make it to the end of the race. Problem was, the resulting car was one that was heavy, slow, and oh yes, still just as unreliable. On only three occasions all year did both cars make it to the finish, the worst record on the grid. Problems behind the scenes failed to help matters either. Within four races, the musical chairs had started back up. After an underwhelming opening few races, Bertie moved over to Prost for the remainder of the year, in hopes of a more secure role, 
and in came De La Rosa. The Spaniard proved a closer match for Irvine than Messrs Herbert or Bertie had managed, with a final qualifying head-to-head of 7-6 in favour of Eddie. In fact, it was probably a more impressive performance than that, as minimal testing time meant it took Pedro a little while to get up to speed, but within four races he was a point scorer, and thereafter out-qualified Irvine more often than not, even if neither were capable of translating that form into race day. Therein lied another issue for the year, as De La Rosa had described, we would either be good in qualifying but not in the race, or vice versa. A points finish from Pedro in Italy was one of the few times Jaguar did both in 2001. But it was the revolving door in the team principal's office that attracted much of the attention that year, courtesy of the headlines that Rahal was generating. Firstly, it was after the slightly embarrassing faux pas of attempting to offload star driver Irvine to Jordan when a vacancy opened up there. Rahal claimed he'd only done it as a joke to his old friend Eddie Jordan, but suffice to say that Ford's top brass found it as entertaining as a 2023 Grand Prix. Another potential transfer grabbed everyone's attention in one of the sport's most tantalising what-ifs, as Ray Hall attempted to lure F1's top designer Adrian Newey from McLaren to Jaguar. In one of F1's most extraordinary episodes, on the 1st of June 2001 at 8.30am, Jaguar announced that Newey was joining the team in August 2002. In a statement to the press, Newey said that this has not been an easy decision to make and thanked McLaren for his time there. Yet by 4pm the same day, an announcement came out of McLaren that Newey was in fact staying put. Newey then confirmed that news before adding, I regret any speculation which has been caused by my conversations with my good friend Bobby Rahal. What followed was a trip to a high court hearing for all parties concerned, and the conspicuous lack of an Adrian Newey going to Jaguar. Further embarrassment came as Jaguar then failed to poach Williams duo Gavin Fisher and Jeff Willis, with Fisher staying put and Willis instead heading to BAR. Naturally, given the ongoing brilliance of Adrian Newey, one can only ponder just what could have happened if some of Jaguar's future cars had come from the pen of one of F1's greatest minds. For my two cents, I feel it might have been a bit of a disaster. The knife edge between brilliance and chaos that Newey has so often tread reflected in the troubles of some of his cars at McLaren and the beginning of his time at Red Bull would have undoubtedly left the head honchos of Jaguar unimpressed and given their penchant for being trigger happy with personnel, it most likely would have ended badly for all involved. Many thought that the only reason Ray Hall had been put in charge was for the purpose of luring his old friend Newey and when that failed to come off, the writing was on the wall. By August, he was out and the revolving principal door welcomed in Nicky Lauda in his place. With so much concentration diverted to the ins and outs of the Jaguar headquarters, perhaps it wasn't a surprise to see Jaguar struggle on for their second year. Irvine certainly wasn't, stating, we deserve to have the tough time we endured during 2001. Our infrastructure compared to the others was negligible. Crucially for the Jaguar dream, NASA, the man who had envisioned the sea of Ford supporters, retired at the end of the year, and it was safe to say that the man who took his spot, William Clay Ford Jr., did not share the same passions for motor racing. Many boardroom meetings were subsequently held regarding the price tag of an F1 team that wasn't even called Ford, and most infamously sparked the question one day from Ford Jr., who the hell is Edmund Irvine, and why is he the second highest person on our payroll? With the departure of NASA came a reduction for Jaguar's budget by 2003 and perhaps the very first nail in the cat's coffin. Faster than they'd ever circulated on the racetrack, Jaguar was unravelling. Ford were now making serious threats that they'd pull the plug on the operation if results didn't pick up. Money grew tighter given the apathy of Ford's new head honchos towards F1. The introduction of the no-nonsense but polarising Nicky Lauda meant encouraging top personnel in would be a tough ask as was reflected by the left-field choice for their new managing director, an engineer from Ford's rallying operations by the name of Gunter Steiner. Steiner might have played a leading role developing the Ford Focus WRC car, but that hardly meant an obvious translation to the world of Formula One. Plus, as with the others before him, knew the specification for the car was locked in, meaning there was little he could do over the new R3. Within three weeks of 2002, journalist Morris Hamilton recounted receiving a call from Irvine, whose opening line to the conversation was just nine simple words. 
don't put any money on this car, it's shit. Lauda echoed those words, stating that the car was designed all wrong and it just didn't work. The blame was placed on technical director Steve Nichols, who was promptly fired, and thus the ever-growing instability of Jaguar continued to grow. Questions were being asked over the suitability of their drivers, with Martin Brundle declaring Irvine fast and committed but not a team leader, and De La Rosa underrated but needing to toughen up in their head to deliver his full potential. Still, in the much smaller positives column was the fact that Irvine had turned down a £6.6 million payout from Jordan to stay on, whilst Ford had belatedly accepted that having a wind tunnel in England was a smart move. Plus, for once, there was a positive management change when Ford's Richard Parry Jones was placed in charge of the project in May, with a brief to conduct a searching analysis of the team's issues and benefits. He came away from that with an understanding that yes, the team was worth the investment, but worryingly needed more upheaval to get things right. For the first time in their history, Jaguar put points on the board before Monaco when Irvine secured fourth place at the season opener in Australia, a result more due to the swath of broken down machinery at the side of the road than any indication of a somehow miraculously competitive Jaguar. That much is clear from the fact that it took another 13 Grand Prix for Jaguar to trouble the point scorers when Irvine took an excellent sixth in Belgium, somewhat conveniently after Ford had renewed their threats of calling time on the outfit. Those threats, whether empty or not, also spurred the team on to introducing a new front suspension and aero parts at that race, and those upgrades paid dividends in Italy, where Irvine first achieved Jaguar's best qualifying in fifth, and then the next day climbed a couple more places to the final step of the podium, though with the asterisk that this was assisted by the retirement of both Williams's and Kimi Raikkonen. Yet again, this result failed to produce any consistency within the outfit, and by the next race at Indianapolis, the team languished outside the points once more, whilst the continued misdirection of the outfit was perhaps best symbolised when, after De La Rosa retired with a transmission failure, he was advised to vault over the trackside barriers to get off the circuit, which he did, right into a water-filled ditch. Still, in one of F1's most stagnant years, it was the only podium all year from a team that wasn't called Ferrari, McLaren or Williams. Jaguar had gone from fighting over the last places with Minardi's to best of the rest towards the end of the year, perhaps showing they had finally demonstrated an ability to problem solve, and mercifully, had been able to last an entire season without feeling the need to boot someone out the door. Despite one point less than the previous year, Jaguar continued their slow and steady crawl up the constructors' table to rank 7th. Having climbed one place every year, Jaguar seemed primed for that world title by 2008 at least. As positive as the closing part of the year had been, it couldn't completely mask the negative atmosphere of the operation throughout most of 2002. Without that surprise podium, Jaguar would have slumped back down to ninth once more. Once again, an inherently bad car design had left the team snookered early on, and left a scrabble to problem solve for the remainder of the year. Add to that a continued lack of reliability with a 55% retirement rate, often due to failures with hydraulics, whilst the weak nature of the drive shaft transmission and suspension were drawn to people's attention, especially after a horror 67G crash for test driver James Courtney. And if the car was bad, then so too was business behind the scenes. Two tales from some respected F1 authorities give you a sense of just what a sorry state the operation was in at the time. In June that year, a young Mark Webber went to test for Jaguar at Barcelona, and Mark promptly showed up there an hour early, as any young professional would do. Meanwhile, Irvine was getting a massage, promptly rocking up to the garage 15 minutes late. I had it drummed into me that no driver is bigger than his team and vice versa, said Weber. These guys have worked their asses off all night to get the car ready and you come out late? It's not on. To further dig into his future employers, Mark admitted that his lowly Minardi had a better chassis than the Jaguar R3. Our second tale comes from Lauda, who, with an eye on the team's ever-dwindling budget, introduced Parry Jones to a young Dietrich Mateschitz, with the Red Bull boss very interested in either providing sponsorship or acquiring as much as 50% of the team. Ford rejected that offer. Completely crazy, said Lauda. These people would rather close down the team than have an energy drink on their car. And that wouldn't be the only Austrian Jaguar rejected that year. 
When the Guardian broke the news on the 26th of November that Lauder had been sacked, no one really blinked an eye. This was the Ford way, after all. Continuing the ever-worrying trend of refusing any form of stability, for the fourth straight year Jaguar entered with a new driver lineup. Only this time both Irvine and De La Rosa were put out to pasture, and in came the very youthful pairing of Weber and Antonio Pizzonia. Out went over 200 Grand Prix of combined experience, and in came one with just 16, all courtesy of Weber. Few were impressed. Jacques Villeneuve was quoted as saying, let's be honest, even Ford's rally driver Colin McRae couldn't do much worse than those drivers. And the equally blunt Nigel Mansell openly questioned what qualities either driver brought to the outfit. Do they know what Grand Prix racing is all about? Uh, I don't think so, grunted the great mustachioed one. Yet other sources were a touch more hopeful. Weber was described as a gung-ho athlete with a will to win and the confidence and application to make this happen whilst former Williams test driver Pizzonia's ability to match the pace of the likes of Montoya and Schumacher in his time there were talked up. You'd argue that maybe a shake-up was what Jaguar needed to get things going, yet arguably the outfit had yet to not be shaken in all its time. Talented and promising the duo might have been, but it was more indicative of a team looking to cut costs. With the departure of Lauder, in came Tony Purnell, founder of motorsport electronic business Pi Research, Pernell may well have brought a more analytical approach to the team, but he also brought a CV with absolutely no experience in running a racing team, let alone one competing at the highest rung of the motorsport ladder. My task over the next two years is to win some respect, he said. Much like similar sentiments from Ray Hall two years previously, such a vague target smacked of an outfit that wasn't really sure where it was going or what was achievable. Add to that a reduction in the team's budget with 70 staff members made redundant. But Purnell even saw positives in that. I have a feeling that in two or three years, tidally run teams like ours will be the F1 insiders, able to do things efficiently on the funds available. Purnell was confident in laying the foundations for something outstanding within the next five years, whilst Weber admitted that whilst the greenest of teams was the leanest of machines, We could take it one step at a time, build some momentum, and by 2005, we might find ourselves in a position to win races. That positivity was echoed by Parry Jones, who proudly proclaimed a confidence that Jaguar would one day win the constructors and that we know how to come fifth or fourth, not that we'll do that this year. This is a long-term investment, we're playing a long-term game. Three double DNFs in the first three rounds hardly inspired any confidence, but it masked a genuine step forward from the Black Cat. In Australia, Weber, in mixed conditions, had started on dry tyres and after the first safety car, had carved his way into fourth place. Though passed by the superior Raikkonen and Schumacher, he was hanging onto their coattails and was running ahead of a venture in a Coulthard when his suspension failed. A race win might be slightly too fanciful, but a big points haul wasn't. More points went begging after gear selection issues in Malaysia and then in Brazil, Weber and Jaguar were right back up at the pointy end of the field. After first qualifying, Weber took full advantage of the ever-changing conditions to put the car on provisional pole, and even when conditions dried out on Saturday, he still qualified third, only four hundredths from pole, easily Jaguar's closest gap to the front yet. On a wet and wild Sunday, Weber was one of a multitude of drivers who could have scored a podium, but like that multitude, was caught out by the treacherous conditions. Weber was offered a new five-year deal on the strength of those races, and Jaguar's critics were left with eggy faces. Another notable race included Austria, where he set the third fastest lap and would have finished higher than seventh if not for a stop-go penalty. A dizzying lap in Hungary saw him qualify third again, but Once more, he couldn't match that on race day, and as pole sitter Alonso scampered down the road, Weber instead held up those behind en route to a strong sixth place, one which Mark was adamant was the first time the outfit scored a result purely on merit, without relying on the misfortune of others that year. It was one of eight point scoring finishes for Jaguar, comfortably the best performance in that department so far, though admittedly helped by an alteration to the point system that now awarded points for the top eight places. It's difficult to analyse how good a year it was for the duo of Weber and Jaguar. There was dazzling promise and opportunity on Saturdays, but too often 
would inevitably dissolve into lower placings and disappointment on Sundays. It would be easy to simply throw Weber in with the likes of Jarno Trulli and Charles Leclerc as those who were simply better on Saturdays than Sundays. But the truth was that the R4 was yet another Jaguar car with ongoing issues. It was exceedingly harsh on its tyres which from a positive perspective meant they could be brought up to racing temperatures very quickly, resulting in fantastic one lap performance, but also a very high level of degradation that left it struggling in races. And that was doubly bad news for those who were struggling to string that one lap pace together on the other side of the garage. There were no prizes for guessing which F1 garage was engaged in the most rumour-churning turmoil. This time it was Pizzonia over whom the grumblings were concerning. After four races, whilst Jaguar had offered Weber a new long-term deal, they were also having to deny that Antonio's seat was under threat. Denials which weren't helped when it was revealed that Jaguar had sounded out either Anthony Davidson or Justin Wilson as potential replacements, and had gone as far as to approach McLaren test driver Alex Wirtz with what was described as a ham-fisted, far-from-acceptable offer. As with fellow Brazilian Bertie previously, the ongoing rumour crank failed to settle Pizzonia, and shortly after the British Grand Prix, he became the latest Jaguar recruit to be given the boot. In came Wilson, but with just five races to stake his claim for a 2004 seat and no testing, it was perhaps unsurprising to see the Englishman flounder too. The struggles of two promising young talents in the same car suggested dwindling levels of attention on the outfit, and budget restraints perhaps hampering Jaguar into becoming a one-car outfit, a rumour backed up by the fact that Jaguar were the only midfield operation to fail to score a double points finish all year which arguably cost them sixth place in the constructors. Still, if we cover one eye and focus on just 50% of the garage, for the first time since their debut there was an air of optimism surrounding Jaguar. Arguably this had been their best season yet, which was perhaps at odds with the base results. Under the pre-2003 point system it would have been their lowest scoring year yet with just a pitiful three points to their name. A haul of three sixth places and four sevenths would have previously resulted in several upturned noses at Ford HQ, but they were results garnered from a year in which the top eight point scoring positions had effectively been on lockdown from the big four of Ferrari, Williams, McLaren and Renault. With that in mind, Weber's run of five points finishes in six races was particularly impressive, even if his was the only car having any attention paid to it. What was undebatable was that Jaguar were finally noticeable. Previously, they'd only really been hitting headlines with activities off the track or by the sight of pulling up at the side of the road. But in 2003, there had been some flashes of feel-good potential, like Weber's sterling qualifying efforts in both Brazil and Hungary. Lights at the end of the tunnel, perhaps? The long-awaited wake-up big stretch of the cat. Sadly, it seems like Ford didn't share those same levels of optimism. Money was the big topic going into 2004. Perry Jones stated that if costs continued to escalate, there was no point in being an F1, especially if Jaguar continued their uncompetitive performances. Others on the Ford board agreed, grumbling over why they were funding a project that wasn't even advertising the core Ford brand, thus producing a tiny return of value, neatly forgetting it had been their choice to promote the Jaguar brand over Ford. Despite rumours that Ford would fold its rallying operation to funnel those funds into the dwindling coffers of the F1 project, the British Racing Green became the British Racing Lean, and their budget was slashed to $130 million for 2004, nearly $300 million less than the money spent on their fellow candidates for most disappointing works team, Toyota. The ever-dwindling pile of funds had a knock-on effect on the driver lineup. Whilst Weber would be staying on, Wilson was out and then another unlucky young talent, Giorgio Pantano, was also passed over mere days before he was due to sign a contract in favour of the Red Bull-backed Christian Kleon, who provided a lovely set of bovine stickers for the car and an equally lovely stack of cash for the team too. Quite the drastic U-turn from 2002 then. Even that didn't supply enough extra cash for the new R5, wherein we can scribble out that word new and hastily scribble in derivation of the old R4. It meant that at a time when Jaguar needed to be moving forward to try and save their operation, they'd be standing still. Not only that, but since the R5 was so closely tied to the R4, it would still possess those flaws that had held Jaguar back the previous year, 
notably the awful tyre wear rates. Add to that the new Cosworth CR6 engine which was less powerful than the previous year's models, hopes was suitably low, and remained so after pre-season testing, when Weber was three seconds adrift of the front runners in Barcelona, whilst the less said about how far away Christian Kleen and Tester Bjorn Verheim were, the better. Being a tenth from going fastest at Valencia in February might have suggested a secret turbo button had been discovered, but few were biting that bait. For them, it seemed indicative of similar tactics from other underfunded outfits of the era, fueling low to vault up the timesheets and attempt to trick prospective sponsors into jumping onto the bandwagon, the last roll of a dice for a desperate outfit. Yet what better time for an underdog to now come out swinging? In qualifying for Malaysia, the world was graced by the sight of a Jaguar topping the timesheets, and it was only the all-dominant Schumacher Ferrari that could topple the plucky Weber from a shock pole position. Still, a first front row start for the team at the 69th time of asking was nothing to be sniffed at, given the vast discrepancies in budgets between them and Ferrari, nor was the fact that it was a position earned purely on merit and not a light fuel load. Here was the opportunity for a big result, thought all. Understood, said the anti-store mechanism, which promptly seized at the start and sent Weber plummeting back down the order. And before any child could wail, stop, he's already dead. He subsequently received a puncture from the other Schumacher, then a stop-go penalty for speeding in the pit lane, and to top off a truly dreadful Sunday, a spin into retirement with damaged handling. The question of what could have been that day looms large. It was clear the team had rolled the dice early on in hopes of a big result and lost out. That much was evident from managing director David Pitchforth's review of the year, in which he admits that Jaguar had effectively chucked all their development at the car by the time the season started, rather than the traditional upgrades saved for the start of the European rounds. It gave Jaguar that big early boost, but then shuffled them down the order immediately afterwards. Yet it's a gamble that would have paid off were it not for, in Pitchforth's opinion, the recent budget cuts. He claimed the anti-stall failure was one that could have been avoided had Jaguar had access to a greater depth of expertise and facilities that, in his words, a full budget buys you. Sadly, there was little else to discuss that year. The most notable thing that happened to the team in the next few rounds after Sepang was a special Monaco livery to promote the new Ocean's 12 film, complete with a diamond worth $300,000 affixed to the car nose. Cleon crashed on lap one, and by the time Jaguar personnel arrived at the crash, the diamond had been swiped. Whoever took it seemingly wasn't someone from the team, since no improvements came along, and it took until Germany two-thirds of the way into the season for the team to clamber out of the bottom two places in the Constructors' Championship, which at that point in time had been neatly reserved by backmarkers Jordan and Minardi. After his heroics in both Malaysia and 2003, Weber could only scramble together seven points all year, whilst the fast-track rookie of Kleon was unable to contribute much more, though took full advantage of a multitude of incidents in Belgium to take sixth, which lifted Jaguar up above Toyota in the final year's standings to seventh once more. Seemingly stagnating, something needed to be done. At the Italian Grand Prix, the paddock was awash with the rumour that Ford had finally taken a long, hard look and realised they needed to sort this whole F1 mess out. At a meeting in Detroit, Purnell had been asked what it would take to finally move Jaguar into the winner's column. His response? We're up against Ferrari and to beat them means a massive effort. It's going to take five years. The rumour mill was cranking out the story that subsequently, more investment would be heading to the F1 project and the outfit would finally be rebranded to Ford. Such tales were positive, daring, and maybe just a little too good to be true. Just five days later, on the 17th of September 2004, Ford announced that Jaguar would be withdrawing from F1 and would be put up for sale as well as their Cosworth branch. Whilst shocking given the rumours that had come in the days before, it was a stark reminder that Ford's interest in F1 had grown increasingly half-hearted. Unlike their purchase of Stuart, finding a buyer for this ready-made outfit proved difficult, as despite interest aplenty, few parties had the funds to keep the team afloat for any more than a couple years, and at least three suitors were rejected before it was snapped up by a familiar face, Red Bull billionaire Dietrich Mateschitz. Out went Purnell, and in came a promising junior team manager by the name of Christian Horner. 
Drivers Coulthard and Klee in racing what would have been Jaguar's 2005 car finished 4th and 7th on Red Bull's debut, and their ongoing exploits have offered a peek into what could have been. Within their first five years, Red Bull converted the outfit to a race-winning championship challenging one and would promptly prance to multiple world titles across the next decade and more. In stark contrast, the Jaguar journey ended, perhaps fittingly, with an implosion on the racetrack as an overly aggressive defence from Cleans where both Jaguars collide and left Webber sat with his own thoughts on the side of the road, perhaps pondering the same question that so many others were doing. How did it all go so wrong? What turned Jaguar's F1 journey from jubilant to jaded? Could it have been the misguided, misinformed opinions of an increasingly disinterested parent company who had no idea on how to run a Formula One team? One who arrogantly and naively snatched the controls from the hands of an organisation who had done so successfully, petulantly declared it mine, only to then pursue a trigger-happy approach of seeking a magical, non-existent, immediate fix to their woes, frequently underestimating the challenge they had bought into, who, when things didn't immediately go their way, elected to throw toys out of the pram, repeatedly slashing funds, abhorring influences from elsewhere and thus creating a toxic, ever-changing environment that rather than nurturing or supporting talent and alternative ideas, instead chewed up and spat out a host of drivers, engineers and team principals, leaving nothing but a charred mess of a team by the end of it. Yeah, could be. For once, we don't need to ponder every what-if or what could have been. The source of Jaguar's jaded F1 journey is a clear and obvious one, apparent from the very moment that Paul slid under the desk of Stuart and immediately began to prowl around the garage. If it hasn't been drummed into you throughout this video, it's a sentiment echoed by so many others with vastly more knowledge of the topic than myself. From Jackie Stewart, who likened the project as like a large multinational organisation trying to run a corner shop. Or Tony Pernell, who described his bosses as high-achieving guys with a Midas touch, whose arrogance backfired. So instead, how about we do something a little bit different? Let's sidle away from the mobile chicane office and into the cosy living room of reflection, don our toasty slippers, stoke our fireplace and settle into a little bit of armchair engineering. We know what went wrong with Jaguar, but is there a universe where it goes right? Where that prophecy of a sea of green does indeed rival that of the Tifosi? Let's tackle the heart of the problem, the management. Let's chuck out all those Ford executives who shouldn't have been within 30 feet of a garage, let alone blindly pretending they knew exactly what they were doing. Instead, let's cast our minds back to when the structure of the team was being born as a little baby Stuart Grand Prix. How Sir Jackie mooted the possibility of the outfit being run under Ford's name, but with the Stuarts doing all the heavy lifting. Sir Jackie asked for cost plus 10%. Let's say that that figure is agreed upon. With this, we can assume finances and budgets will be less of an issue, especially if progress continues along the trends that the Stuarts set. With that, we immediately negate the first big hurdle the team suffered, that of doing things the forward way, a closed and almost secretive route that left the team repeatedly lost and scrabbling to find solutions to their regular car troubles. Gary Anderson has stated that when Ford bought Stuart, it was like a light switch had been turned off. If there had been a more open working culture as there was with Stuart, I genuinely believe that Jaguar could have been as successful as Red Bull. So let's leave the light on for Gary's sake. With the management settled in next, we need to place the driver selection criteria under the spotlight. Though far from the primary source of blame for Jaguar's struggles, a more appropriate driver lineup would have maybe moved things forward a little smoother. And their first selection of Messrs Irvine and Herbert stunk of signings made by people reading bare statistics and numbers rather than any form of informed racing opinion. For instance, Irvine, supposedly Jaguar's star signing, the one meant to guide them in their fight against the other big names. Signing a championship runner-up, one with four wins in their arsenal, sounds impressive on paper. Yet it glosses over how lucky Irvine was in 1999. All four wins came courtesy of either rival retirements or gifts via team orders. 
a two-point deficit to Hakkinen was one perhaps owing more to McLaren's desperation to try and throw away the title that year, as well as an injured Michael Schumacher, than any indication Irvine was a true title contender. Indeed, as early as just eight races into Jaguar's time in F1, the Sunday Times released a withering evaluation on Jaguar's season thus far, and the most eye-catching remark read, Many mistakes have been made, but signing Eddie Irvine was probably the biggest. What Jaguar received was someone with an ongoing and nonchalant manner around the pits, with his rare standout moments more in line with someone pushing with a fleeting fancy than any regular source of gumption. A divisive, unmotivating force. In Irvine's own words, I came to Jaguar from Ferrari and felt that one of my responsibilities was to explain just how far they had to progress before they made it as a competitive force. By 2002, publications described him as a persona non grata within the outfit. Even louder, famed for his own critical analysis, said that Irvine was often too frank. Add to that an ageing Johnny Herbert, who had previously been described by onlookers in 99 as a shadow of his best, and arguably only kept his drive due to that somewhat fortunate win in Europe, you have a questionable driver lineup if you're looking for a duo to take the team to the next step beyond the midfield. You have to feel that with the Stewarts calling the shots, a more suitable lineup would have been secured, one made on an informed decision rather than just cold statistics. Granted, they too had made mistakes with driver choices in the past, but you wonder if, with our gentle nudging from the future, they could have looked towards more suitable candidates, one with experience and enthusiasm for the project, a Frentzen or a Coulthard, or even holding on to Barrichello and allowing him to grow into a team leader position alongside a promising talent like a Fisichella or a Trulli. And moving forward, rather than generating a faster discard pile than a game of Uno, You wonder too just what effect an operation with experience in nurturing young talents through the junior formula would have had on those so many battered and bruised during their time at Jaguar. Again, it would be no guarantee when we saw how quickly a prodigy like Jan Magnussen was chewed up and spat out, though the reasons why may perhaps be a tale for another time. But you can't help but feel that under Stuart's supervision, the likes of a Bertie, Pizzonia or Wilson might have flourished a little better. Add to that mix a need to fix an inherently weak test team. Jaguar's testing roster would include names like Schechter, Lotterer and Verdheim, but never anyone with a modicum of Grand Prix experience. To echo Mansell's words from 2003, do they know what Grand Prix racing is all about? So how could they be expected to efficiently test or problem solve the repeatedly broken cars? The likes of Bedoa at Ferrari, Panis and Verts at McLaren, Genet at Williams, all prove the value of experience within that operation. The signing of someone with that level of experience could have solved a lot of problems. And with the right sort of management and then drivers in place, we tackle the next problem, the car. And perhaps the biggest what if of the whole saga. What if Jaguar had signed Adrian Newey? And then a second question, why didn't they? Was it a question of money? Seemingly not, for Jaguar put forward a $10 million paycheck for Nui, exactly the same as what Red Bull offered him. In fact, adjusting for inflation, Jaguar would have offered up more, around $11.4 million. The issue was more due to Ford, their internal politics, and the undermining of Rahal, according to both Nui and Rahal. But if we've removed all those elements from this reality, there surely wouldn't be much stopping Nui from heading to Milton Keynes several years earlier especially if the outfit continued trending upwards and attracted the attentions of a star driver or had successively nurtured one of those young talents, a la Red Bull and Sebastian Vettel. Fernando Alonso tested for Jaguar in 2002. Can you imagine a reality where that young talent joins forces with an operation on the up with a car designed by Adrian Newey? Add to that a Ford Cosworth department receiving appropriate funding and working in time with the main outfit rather than being segregated, and you get something quite tantalising. But if that entire world-warping, reality-bending concept is a stretch too far, then maybe we can beg for just one change from Ford. Simple one-word idea. Patience. Rome wasn't built in a day, and nor has the success of an F1 manufacturer. Perhaps an apt-life lesson would come from another manufacturer like Mercedes. 
They, like Ford, bought an outfit following an incredibly successful year. And naturally, all eyes turned on the seemingly logical step to an immediate return with wins and championships galore. Which didn't happen. But toys weren't thrown out of prams, ruthless chops and changes weren't made. There was an understanding that regardless of impressive financial resources or management expertise, that this was a project. And so those in charge of the F1 team were allowed to get on with it without a fearful reproach from those in the ivory towers. A right culture was created. People were allowed to be open with problems and those problems could be isolated and corrected by the best people for the job. And lo and behold, within five years, we entered the start of the Mercedes monolith of titles. With all the right ingredients in place, utilised by the right cooks, crucially, there's every chance that perhaps at worst a Ford F1 team could have hovered around best of the rest, sneaked another win or two, and subsequently been in prime position for a title challenge when the Ferrari stranglehold at the top of the table finally shattered in 2005. Maybe we all just sat through the Max Verstappen slash Ford show the last year. Who can say? Instead, what could have been something mighty is consigned to a footnote in the record books. A tale dragged out as a cautionary tale for others. A stray black cat that never came home. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, consider pulling into the pit box of my channel, bolting on the tires of hitting that subscribe button and tearing off the fresh visor of hitting the like button. I've had word from the pit wall that it's the best strategy available for you.